Good morning and welcome to this meeting of the UK Trade and Business Commission. Um, today's session is looking at the state of relations between the United Kingdom and the European Union and the negotiations that are taking place uh, and the politics. And we are really grateful to our witnesses this morning for making the time available to give us the benefit of their knowledge and expertise. This should be a really, really good session. I wonder if I could just begin by asking our witnesses to introduce themselves for the record, just looking in order that you are appearing, starting with you, uh, Natalie. Yes, thank you, uh, all of you from both sides of the channel. My name is Nathalie Loiseau. I'm a French member of the European Parliament, a previous Minister for European Affairs in the uh, Macron government, uh, a dedicated Anglophile, which is not only as popular as it used to be, um, and uh, so working in the uh, UK contact group of the European Parliament, uh, monitoring uh, everything Brexit related. Well, you're most welcome, and it's uh, really good to see you today. Uh, next, Terry. Thanks a lot, Hilary, and thanks a lot for the invitation. My name is Terry Reinhardt. I'm a Green member of the European Parliament elected <clears throat> in Germany, um, and I'm also a dedicated Anglophile, just like Natalie, um, and I'm one of the co-founders also together with Natalie of the EU-UK Friendship Group in the European Parliament, <laughs> and now also uh, uh, appointed already to be a member of the UK delegation uh, in the European Parliament. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Georgina? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, and um, thank you to everyone who is listening in. My name is Georgina Wright. I'm the head of the Europe programme at the French think tank <coughs> in Paris, um, where I sort of look at the EU very closely. I'm British, but I am a Francophile, um, so I'm very much looking forward to this uh, session. Thank you very much indeed, jo Georgina. And uh, last but by no means least, uh, Peter. Um, another Brit and another Francophile, um, an unelected member of Parliament in the House of Lords. I'm a 40-year diplomat and my last uh, posting was as ambassador in Paris and I've been involved in EU affairs throughout my career. Well, you're all very welcome. Can I just say for those who are watching, uh, Terry will have to leave us uh, at some point in the session because of other commitments and we will, we're expecting to be joined at about 11 o'clock by uh, Ambassador Almeida, who is the European Union Ambassador to the United Kingdom. Um, can I just say to our commissioners and to witnesses, as ever, we have a lot of ground to cover uh, in the time available, so succinct questions and succinct answers would be much appreciated. Uh, we have to finish by uh, midday, um, and we've got a lot of things to discuss. And with that introduction, can I turn to Alison Williams, who's going to put the first question. Alison, over to you. Thank you. And yeah, thank you to all the, um, the witnesses and experts joining us today. Uh, so as an opening question, we want to get a sense of um, where the uh, where the relations are between the EU and the UK now that um, Brexit's a reality. So it'd be great to hear from each of you on how you would describe the relations between those two and um, what you think, uh, what the thinking is around the EU about the UK now that Brexit has happened. Um, so if we could start with Natalie, that'd be great. Well, thank you for giving me the floor. Um, well, the UK uh, left the European Union, but didn't leave Europe. Um, and uh, or the reasons for having strong relations between the UK and the EU are obvious. We have common interests, we, have, uh, we are facing the same challenges, and we have so many partnerships and uh, relations that we have to preserve. But I would not say that the current situation of our uh, relations is satisfactory. Despite the trade and cooperation agreement, which was signed and ratified on both sides, uh, we are still lacking uh, some political uh, momentum uh, to improve uh, or preserve uh, our partnerships. Uh, I would, of course, uh, uh, insist 
on the fact that we have no uh, structured partnership on foreign policy uh, and defense at a moment where it's obvious that we should work more together facing the same challenges just to begin with what took place in Afghanistan and the consequences which are dire for all of us. Um, and on other topics as well, I think this should be better. But uh, my feeling, uh, and I'm very sincere because I'm a, a, a true friend and true friends uh, speak their mind, uh, there is still too much ideology uh, and the word Brexit is still used too often. Uh, uh, as regards the way the European Union views things. Yesterday, uh, there was the uh, State of the Union uh, addressed by uh, Ursula von der Leyen in the European Parliament, a big moment of European democracy where we take stock about what took place last year and try to discuss what we want to do uh, in the coming year. And a number of my British friends were struck and shocked because they didn't hear the word Brexit and they didn't hear the word United Kingdom. Well, that's a signal that the EU is moving forward, is not Brexit obsessed uh, and is not obsessed by blaming uh, our partner for things that go right or for things that go wrong. Uh, and I think that we have to acknowledge this. I think we should try to normalize uh, our discussions uh, and get out of some sort of hysteria that took place and that is still sometimes at least in British media and is not helpful to fix problems and move forward. Thank you. That's yeah, that's um, really interesting observations about the, the emotion attached to it all. Um, OK, can we uh, move on to Terry, please? Sure, thanks a lot. <clears throat> I mean, maybe first of all, I generally agree with what um, Natalie has been saying. I think that the relationship has been deteriorating. Um, if I look back a little bit, like my childhood growing up in Germany, I think the UK was always seen as um, one of our strongest allies and um, that there is a lot of, uh, you know, rationality in British politics. And um, I think that that image has really shifted over the past years, maybe as a as an anecdote, also from my own experience, when I talk to people who are not in politics, who are not so close, you know, with the with the developments. Um, and I think that on a diplomatic level, on a political level, a lot of trust has been broken. I think there was in the past years, very often, if I want to maybe see what, what the UK government, what role the UK government played, um, misrepresentation of some of the issues that the European Union was bringing forward. I mean, now the recent developments uh, regarding the Northern Ireland Protocol are certainly not always helpful as well. But I would also like to criticize the European side because maybe they have a little bit of a different view uh, than Natalie. I was also very disappointed that uh, Ursula von der Leyen did not mention the UK at all in the State of the Union because I actually believe that it's a wrong move to turn away now um, from from you know mentioning the uk and really working on the relations because if we have this analysis that trust has been broken i think our aim should be to rebuild this trust because when we look at the tca i mean it is certainly not what we wanted from the side of the european parliament not in terms of um, the scope that it has, Natalie was mentioning foreign relations, but there are also other issues that are not integrated uh, in this agreement, but also there are a lot of issues that will be very challenging to actually put into reality. I mean, when you look at this rebalancing mechanism, it is something that is completely new in a trade agreement, and we will need a trusting relationship to make that work. Uh, and this is why I would actually like also from the European side to have more investment into rebuilding these relations, obviously also from the UK side, um, and I hope that we can use um, uh, also in the next month uh, the opportunities that we will have also traveling more. There will be the COP in the UK in the end of the year um, to actually have platforms again that we can have these exchanges because I think that they're really lacking at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. That is a really powerful statement, the idea of the trust being broken. I think um, absolutely right around the uh you know, as we go forward how do we build that up again through um travel and and um, more connection thank you um can i go to lord ricketts please uh, thank you very much and 
I mean, I think those were two very powerful statements by good friends of Britain in Europe that we ought to listen to here. Uh, and it feels to me the same way, I'm sitting in London, but staying in touch with friends around Europe. I think the mood is distrustful. I think it's um, transactional now. I think rather than seeing the UK as a partner, it's seen as a problem to be managed uh, where people think about it at all. Um, and Terry is kind to say that you know, the EU should pay more attention to the UK, but my own feeling is that the UK has become much, much less relevant to the central preoccupations of the EU now, um, as set out in, in uh, van der Leyen's speech. Um, and for the UK, uh, it is ideological. I think that's right. I think there has been a hope, um, um, aspiration, that by working on improving relations individually with France and Germany and one or two other member states, um, that we can, can replicate what we had in, in some areas of the EU. I don't think that's going to work. I think um, although France and Germany will, of course, work with this in some areas, um, they will, their first loyalty will always be to the EU. And it, it is not a strategy that can work to try and build bilateral relations while the relationship with the EU is dysfunctional. So I, of course, completely agree that we should get back to rebuilding cooperation, starting in foreign affairs. It doesn't feel to me like the British government is at all in the mode of looking to rebuild. At the moment, it's treating the EU as a convenient scapegoat for many of the other problems in the country uh, and not really looking for constructive solutions even on Northern Ireland. So the time will come, I'm absolutely sure, um, for rebuilding. Uh, I fear it may not be um, while this particular um, cabinet of politicians is in power. Thank you, um, Lord Ricketts. Yeah, I, I um worrying prognosis, but I think it sounds uh, very insightful and, and accurate. Um, can I move on to Georgina, please? Um, thank you, Alison. I mean, I, I fully agree with everything that's been said, so I'll, I'll be very brief. I mean, I think relations aren't good, but that's not entirely a surprise. And I will say that um, I think a period of mourning was always going to be necessary after such a you know, politicised and political negotiations. Um, I think, uh, sitting in Paris at least, um, some of the surprises is around the UK's uh, confrontational tone. Um, I'm not sure that's helping to kind of rebuild uh, that trust that is so essential, and I think we'll come back to it throughout the, the session. Um, but I think the, also the important thing to note is the EU and the EU27 have kind of moved on from Brexit. Um, you know, in fact, many people had moved on from the negotiations long before they actually ended. Um, and, you know, they want to think about the new chapter. Um, but I think uh, uh, Lord Ricketts is right. You know, the EU does pay less attention to its neighbours than it does its own, its own members. And in terms of third countries, you know, there's the US and China, and then there's the rest. So actually, um, you know, it's going to be essential to have that trust, but also the UK is going to have to work a lot harder to be listened to. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it sounds like our, our position has, has really fundamentally changed. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll pass back. Alison, thank you very much. Uh, Indeed, and thanks for those uh, opening assessments. Right, I'm next going to turn to Tamara Chinchik. Tamara. Thank you. Um, my question is, looking back over the period since 2016, how would you characterise the UK approach to the negotiations? How effective was it in delivering its objectives? Um, and I'll start with you, if I may, Lord Ricketts, please. Well, we could spend all day on this, but of course mm, we do need agree. to spend most of our time looking forward, I think, rather than back. But just briefly to look back, <clears throat> I mean, my own assessment is that Theresa May missed an enormously important opportunity when she came into power um, after the referendum to pause the process. She was the master of the timetable at that point. She could have said, uh, I need a year to work out what the referendum means, what people uh, want to have some sort of national commission or something, um, which would have at least hammered out some basic principles for our negotiators to pursue. And she didn't do that. She rushed into um, triggering Article 50 and the two-year timetable before we had any sense, really, of whether there was any degree of national agreement on what um, the uh, future relationship with the EU should be. Um, and therefore, British negotiators, who I think Natalie and Terry would agree, are normally well prepared, have a good brief and you know, know what they're after, 
didn't really know what they were after. They had the prime minister's red lines, but no more than that. And so I think, honestly, uh, the British side played a poor hand in the negotiations because it didn't really know what it wanted. Theresa May never had a parliamentary majority or anything positive. Parliament knew what it didn't want, but didn't know what it did want. Um, and that is where trust began to leach away, I think, um, as the EU side had to essentially work out from the UK's red lines what kind of a future relationship was going to be possible, um, having first of all secured their interests in the withdrawal agreement. So no, I mean, I don't think I don't think Theresa May had any clear objectives and therefore she didn't achieve them. When Boris Johnson came in at this last point, he did have one clear objective, which was to get Britain out of the EU and to re-establish what he called sovereignty, which is a pretty um, a slippery term really, but nominal sovereignty, um, taking back control. And he achieved that. And the EU achieved their objective at that point, which was to protect the integrity of the single market. And the UK came out massively a loser from that bargain. So I, I think you drew, drew on something that was in my head when I was asking the question is I think the UK was very clear on what it didn't want and less clear on what it did want. And do you think that had we had this commission, although you would have had voices saying, but you're delaying Brexit, that's not what we asked for. Do you think it would have been a point where we could have unified the vision? Theresa May had great power at that point. I mean, they had just replaced in the Conservative Party, David Cameron. Um, she, she was not about to be replaced immediately either. Mm. She could have called the shots uh, okay. and she could have at least got people to uh, work out what kind of a deal um, did Britain want. I think at that point, actually, even the Leave campaign would have settled for a close, you know, constructive relationship with the EU, um, closer than we are now with the single mm. market and the customs mm. union, avoiding a lot of the problems that we've had. Mm. If that had been crystallized, it would have taken time. but. You know, in the past, sometimes this country has come together to set out some objectives, and uh, I think that was a real opportunity missed. That's a very interesting point. Um, I, I, I think you, I think that's a very valid point as well. Remembering uh, from from my industry as well, the the fallout of the of the confusion around trade and and all the red tape. Yeah. I th I agree with you on that. I think it's a it, it's a missed opportunity. I don't think that was intended by many people when they voted leave. Um, no. You know, per for perfectly honourable reasons, but they didn't expect that outcome, I don't think. I, I agree. It was probably an unforeseen consequence of that. Um, thank you for that, Lord Ricketts. Georgina Wright, if I may ask you the same question. Would you like me to repeat the question or have you got it written down? No, I, was it um, how, looking back, how many... Yes, yes. So um, I, I think that's a really good question um, and I completely agree with, with Lord Ricketts. I mean, I think to start off with, maybe credit where it's due. I mean, it was a huge, it is an extraordinary achievement that the UK and EU were able to negotiate, uh, you know, the TCA in, an, in under 11 months during a global pandemic. Um, and, you know, if you look at sort of typically EU trade negotiations, they take between a year and a half and seven years to conclude. And this was much more than a simple trade agreement. Um, and it was by no means a foregone conclusion. As we know, it was touch and go several times. Um, it was, you know, it, in the public debate all the time. Usually trade negotiations aren't that uh, politicised um, throughout. And also um, a closer look at the actual agreement shows that both sides did move from their original mandate. So I think you know, credit where it's due and credit to our, our negotiators on, on both sides. Um, but uh, to sort of um, complete what Lord Ricketts was saying, I think there was a problem at the very start where the UK knew exactly what it didn't want, but not quite what it wanted. But it didn't it also didn't really know how it was going to approach this negotiation and i've written about this before and i have received pushback and obviously i was not sat in the, you know i wasn't in the room so i don't really know exactly how it unfolded um but i think the uk government was slow to realize that negotiating as a big member state inside the eu is a radically different experience to negotiating as a third country with the eu so when you're a big member state you essentially call the shots right mm. you, you say loudly and clearly if you agree with a commission proposal and if you don't um, and if you don't you then call up member states you think are likely to share your point of view and you try and block it in council all of a sudden, the UK was in a position where it couldn't do that because it was on the other side of the table. So the, the initial tactic of, you know, trying to um, do it bilaterally uh, with individual member states, I mean, it was very important to put forward the British position and to make sure that 
EU capitals understood it, but fundamentally, this negotiation was going to be done the same way as all EU trade negotiations are, going to be, uh, are done, which is the Commission, you know, um, negotiating on behalf of the 27 member states, and of course, the other institutions. And I think that was um, that that sort of uh, change in dynamic, um, you know, the fact that the EU was so united. I mean, I wasn't surprised at all by that. I thought the EU is going to approach it the same way it does all no negotiations, you know, appoint a very good team, um, make sure that you update regularly the member states, but also the European Parliament. And then, of course, Michel Barnier, the you know, lead negotiator, went out of his way to talk to national parliaments and trade association groups and NGOs and all sorts. So I think that the, the, you know, slow to understand that that was different. And then, of course, there were some uh, points in, in the negotiation. I'm thinking of the Chequers Agreement uh, in 2018. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the very early on in the negotiation saying, well, the UK is going to significantly diverge. That was obviously going to mean that the EU was going to be much more adamant about finding some some way of, of managing that divergence going forward. And so it shifted away from the opportunities of market access to protection um, mm. and making sure that we abide by similar rules. So, um, but again, I think let's not forget that it, it is an extraordinary achievement. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm aware of time. So um, I'm just going to ask Natalie. I mean, of course, the one point to add is, of course, the UK population weren't united behind that, which I think draws on Lord Ricketts idea of a commission and a unified, united vision of what Brexit would have been. And I, um, I, I'm just bringing that thought into the into the question as well. And, and your thoughts on this question. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, uh, go in the same direction as uh, Peter Ricketts. Um, the British Prime Minister, be it Theresa May or Boris Johnson, were the masters of time for this negotiation. And it was surprisingly bumpy. There was a lot of st stop and go. Many time lost, many time wasted, uh, where we could have uh, discussions at the technical level and nothing was taking place. Um, refusal by Boris Johnson to extend the transition period. Uh, when we see today that checks will not be in place simply because they are not ready. Uh, I'm not criticizing this. It's a huge um, uh, undertaking for the uh, British authorities. Everybody would have understood that it would have required more time, but it was rejected on ide ideological uh, basis. Uh, as you said, a number of red lines and very few green lights. Uh, it was very difficult to say, okay, we take stock of progress uh, and then we'll see the difficulties at the end of the day. It was more, we have difficulties and we are not working on progress. Uh, on the political landscape, yes, that was a huge difficulty for us. We all beca became experts on uh, the British uh, political landscape. Um, and it was quite surprising, I have to say, um, on the Tory side. We heard much more about the DUP than about uh, the position of the Tory party. On the um, Labour side, sorry, old friends, but um, at the time where Jeremy Corbyn was leading the, the, the Labour, he seemed to pay no attention to Brexit. We were paying more attention to Brexit than some of the uh, British political leaders. And uh, as regards um, our Lib Dem friends, they were still trying to um, think that uh, the most important was um, to uh, erase the results of the referendum. So that was very difficult for us to, to deal with. Uh, but I have to blame ourselves because we were so silent before the referendum. We were not even proud of what we were able uh, to do within the European Union. We didn't sell it to uh, our British friends and that, that is our mistake to my view. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Right. We are going to have to move on because time is, is very tight. Uh, Paul Blomfield. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Hilary. I wonder if I can pick up on um, a point that uh, Georgina made about confrontational tone. Um, and uh, clearly the UK government have been suggesting at flashpoints subsequent to the deal that the EU needs to show more flexibility. Um, I wonder how far our panelists think that's a reasonable criticism or is it a matter of the UK not 
um, understanding its position as a third country, or having expectations of the EU that were never going to be delivered. And I, I wonder if I could start with Terry. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, and yeah, I think maybe we talk now about how the UK approached the negotiations. I think if you look at the picture on the EU side, it was basically the opposite because we had a very united uh, council. So the member states uh, were, uh, were all really united. We had a European Parliament that set out very clear vision of how we want this to work and what we want out of this. Um, and I think this was obviously then setting a frame for the European Commission, who are also much better prepared in a way uh, for these negotiations. And this is also why then the proposals that were coming from the European side were basically becoming the, the um, drafts that all the negotiations were happening on. And I think that this call for flexibility again and again, I don't fully buy it. Because when I look back now, I mean, if I look at the situation with the Northern Island, uh, Island Protocol, for example, to me, there are only two options. Either the, U, the, the UK side in the negotiations really didn't fully understand what they were signing up to, or honestly, they were signing up to something that they never really intended of implementing in the end. And I think that obviously, I hope it's the first part of the, uh, of the options, um, but I think that this was the situation for them because in the campaign, things had been promised from all sides what would happen and all the things that the UK would get that these promises, they, they could never be kept because they were so unrealistic and so out of the what was in the re reality, what was realistically possible in these negotiations that I think they were basically starting from a position where they could only fail in a way. And I think that right now, the UK government, from my perspective, is still trying to defend this. And I think that the much better strategy would be to acknowledge this, you know, that there was a starting point from which things would get really difficult because what was promised could never be kept in the end. Um, and I think that for the actual implementation of what we have now in terms of the withdrawal agreement, but also in terms of the TCA now becoming real, and saying, look, this is what we have, and we try to make it work. Um, I think this would be the first step, um, not only to then implement these agreements, but also to rebuild the trust that we spoke about in the beginning, and then really to build a relationship that is then sustainable and, um, and fit for the future. Okay. okay, thanks. So there's a need for more, you would see it as honesty um, on the UK side. Natalie, how do you see that? Well, um, I think, first of all, flexibility from the European Union is difficult to ask for because we have to build a position uh, uh, with converging views from 27 member states and different political groups in the European Parliament and even different sides within the Commission. At the moment, we have a position, it's quite difficult to change it. Uh, but we were pragmatic. That's the first time in my life I was a former career diplomat where pragmatism was on the EU side and ideology on the British side. Usually it was the other way around. Um, and uh, as the UK was still betting on divide and rule uh, and it didn't work, um, it was very difficult to move on. But even now, uh, we are uh, putting uh, uh, proposals on flexibilities around uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol. We are trying to uh, uh, start from the needs of people in Northern Ireland and try to address these needs and be as pragmatic as possible. But still, we have an agreement. Uh, everybody knows it by heart and the negotiators in London are the same who are in power now. And they are not talking about flexibilities, they are talking about redrafting an international agreement uh, and a commitment. And of course, we are, as the EU, believe in uh, 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 an international rules-based order. And we believe that it was the case of the UK. So it's extremely troubling and not completely helpful. Thanks very much. I'd love to pursue that with others, but I think uh, time forces me to return to, to uh, Hillary now. Paul, thank you very much uh, indeed for that. Um, Right, next to Jeff Mackey. Jeff. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, good morning. For those of us in business, negotiation is very much part of what we take as the rhythm of life. 
However, it would appear the negotiating issues have always been divided into those that seem as difficult, such as data adequacy or agriculture, and those where cooperation is obvious, such as security. I just wondered, would you like to comment on that as a perception? Is that right? And how does that match the view in Brussels? Could we start with Terry, please? Um, actually, when I read the question, I was a little bit surprised that um, you uh, you put the question of security into something that is easy because I had the feeling that um, even in the fields that like that were related to security, there were a lot of potential. There was a lot of potential friction, um, and I think that this was due to the fact that. Um, if we take if we would have taken this out of the political context it would in a lot of things because it just makes sense to cooperate on a lot of issues would have been much much easier but because the debate was so heated up and it was so much on like am i winning something can we you know stick it to the eu if you want to call it that and that made a lot of things much more difficult and i would still say i mean i agree with georgina it's good that we have a deal now for the future relations at the same time I don't think this is a good deal. I don't think it is a. It's, it's complete, and I think in a lot of um, uh, in a lot of areas, um, we will still really have to see how we can make this a reality. We will still have to see how we can actually implement it in reality. And I think, for example, if there had been more time, and if the context in which it was negotiated wouldn't have been as heated, and uh, many more pragmatic solutions could have been found um, to certain questions also the more controversial ones um so i still believe that this deal is not going to be the last word brexit is definitely not done there are still a lot of open questions and we will have to continue to see how we can solve them thanks terry lord ricketts am i being very very naive uh no not at all um and just to underline what terry said we're going to be negotiating between the eu and the uk till the end of time um, uh, or till you know till um, everything changes uh, so it's certainly not done no um, I mean I think all the issues were difficult actually uh, for the reason that Georgina gives that uh, separating the EU uh, and the UK after 40 years together was always going to be difficult across the board some issues were difficult not because of their intrinsic importance economically um, but because of the politics behind them and fish I think perhaps Northern Ireland are the two obvious uh, examples of that and of course, they're interconnected. Uh, you mentioned data adequacy and security. Um, of course, if the UK um, fails to convince the EU to maintain a data adequacy agreement, it will have an impact as well on the security relationship. I think an area that came out well, actually, um, and just a nuance on Terry's point, was the internal security, justice and home affairs area part three of the trade and cooperation agreement, where actually there's a, there's a very large amount of continuity and I was agreeably surprised by, by what the uh, two sides achieved there, with the exception of Britain's exclusion from the Schengen Information System, SIS2, which I think is a problem, um, and an area which should have been easy, foreign policy cooperation, where we have lots of shared interests, turned out to be impossible, as, you, as somebody said, for ideological reasons on the UK side. So. Um, I'm not sure that the amount of agreement reached necessarily reflects the intrinsic difficulty of each issue. A lot of it was around the politics um, on both sides and the ideological blocks in certain cases in the UK side. Thank you very much. Natalie, we, we just need to keep on talking and talk more. How does that sit with the conversation? Well, yes, it's not the end of the story, but I agree with Peter Ricketts uh, and Terry. Things that should have been easy are not done. Let's mention Erasmus. It was one of the bad surprises of the negotiation. We never thought that uh, the UK would shoot itself in the foot because it's basically going against soft power from the UK. Um, agriculture, or at least, uh, I mean, uh, sanitary regulations. Um, if I talk to uh, stakeholders in the UK, producers, uh, farmers, uh, or consumers, they all want the same level of regulation which they had when the UK was a member state. So how come that it became difficult, if not for political reasons? That's the same with fisheries. Fish is British, 
fishermen are Europeans and the market is in the European Union. That's a, that's a fact, that's a given. It has been uh, the fact even before the UK was a member state. Why are we creating problems where there could be solutions? This is ideological. And we are living on problems instead of trying to find solutions. I hope it will change. It's an ongoing discussion. The problem now is again for stakeholders, the absence of previsibility, of visibility, even on data adequacies and a number of other prominent sectors. And yes, indeed, the, the good surprise, the, the magical surprise was that we were grown, grown up in the room on both sides on justice and home affairs, where indeed it's a, a matter of sovereignty, but what is at stake is so important that we were able to overcome our divergences. Thank you, Natalie. Georgina, just to complete my question, if I may, ideology over pragmatism. I mean, you know, I guess it depends who you talk to and what side and at what point in the negotiations. I mean, you know, from, I know that there was quite a lot of frustration on the British side that the EU kept on insisting that everything was a package. So nothing was agreed until everything was agreed. I think there were, you know, um, some people on the British side who thought, well, let's try and make as much progress as we can on those on those issues where we do see eye to eye. But of course, on the EU side, there was a fear that if we did that, we'd run out of time for all those issues where there were real, um, real divergences and differences. So again, I think the the approach to this negotiation was 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 different. Um, and I think that was going to be very difficult to reconcile, given like Lord Ricketts said, but also Terry and, and Natalie, that the politics of it um, made it very difficult. So I would say it, it's helpful to try and move beyond the ideology and the, and the pragmatism and I, I remember talking to a lot of contacts in the EU throughout the negotiations they said you know the UK used to be so pragmatic and I said was it pragmatic or was it just very easy very good at adapting quickly to new situations um, so I think we need to move with that um, the ability to adapt and try and use that as a basis for building trust rather than this hope that somehow there's pragmatism or, or vice versa, um, an emphasis on ideology. Thank you very hey, much. Thank you, Jeff, Chair. Jeff, thanks very much indeed. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Chair. And it's lovely to welcome our witnesses and in particular my, my green colleague, colleague Terry. So uh, great to see you. Um, I must say it's incredibly painful to relive all of these wasted opportunities and so forth. But on that subject, if, if I might come back to, to Lord Ricketts and pick up where you left off Lord Ricketts on question two when you said we, we kind of played our hand pretty poorly. Did the UK make full use of, of the different diplomatic approaches after 2016? I'm thinking of things like, you know, using our wider networks, our diplomatic posts, our elected politicians, and in particular, has our approach of a lead negotiator working directly to the PM been effective or was that not such a great idea? Um, it's a very interesting set of questions, and I think it, it bears on the negotiating style of the two sides, which has already been touched on. Um, I think Georgina said that uh, Michel Barnier was very open. I mean, first of all, his mandate was published and clear. He reported frequently to the Council. He reported to the European Parliament on what was going on. And Theresa May, partly because of her very weak position within her own party, was very, very secretive. Uh, and actually what was happening uh, in the negotiations, what the British were actually saying, was a closely guarded secret. So much so that I think the European Parliament were better informed about the British position in the negotiations than the British Parliament was. Um, and, and therefore I think that British diplomats around Europe were also handicapped. Normally, as you say, we would be um, getting our embassies in the capitals, lobbying, uh, opinion formers, parliamentarians all around the place. I'm not sure that they were cut in to actually what the negotiating strategy was, except in the most broad terms, in terms of Prime Minister's public statements. So, I mean, there was a degree of effort to pick off individual uh, countries to divide and rule, as Natalie said, but I don't think it was um, um, very effective. I don't think it was going to work anyway. Uh, but I think there's a real reflection to be done on the British side about the style of negotiation because the secretiveness, I think, weakened um, our capacity to lobby um, for our cause. And the um, structure set up, I think, was pretty dysfunctional, actually. I think to create a new department, um, DEXU, separate from the Foreign Office, um, at very short notice, um, guaranteed friction, and then to have a minister and also a senior official um, who were sort of double-hatted as leading it, uh, David Davis and then Dominic Raab, 
and then a, a senior official um, as Ollie Robbins was most of the time. Um, I think left the European partners confused as to who actually was doing the negotiating, who was licensed to put forward proposals. Um, always before, Whitehall has worked very well with a, a very senior uh, Europe official advising the Prime Minister sitting in the Cabinet Office, um, and there's been a great succession of those. Um, and then with ministers deciding the policy in cabinet or a cabinet committee. Um, and that kind of command structure broke down because of the secretiveness and because of the rather weird um, uh, departmental structure. And I'm not sure that the minister and senior civil servant combination ever worked. It was better finally when there was one senior official reporting to the prime minister. Um, but I do think the British side ought to reflect on what I think was a more effective negotiating style adopted in the EU. I think by necessity, because nothing ever stays secret in the EU, but I think they turned it to advantage. Thank you. Could I ask Natalie what it felt like from your perspective, please? Well, I fully agree that the, the, the Barnier's method uh, being completely transparent made a whole difference uh, because he was not only talking to uh, uh, governments and to, to the parliament, but also to national parliaments, to trade unions, to businesses. And I can testify how often British stakeholders would come to me to try to know what was the British position. Uh, and it was really weird. Um, and they were seemingly not really listened to because what they were pushing for was exactly the European position. Uh, that's the first thing. Second, I have to uh, admit and acknowledge that uh, when you become a third state, uh, having been a member state for years and decades, you have lost part of the competences. Uh, if, God forbid, France was to leave the European Union, we don't know how to negotiate trade agreements because this is a competence of the European Union, which should hire hundreds of experts to do the job. And that was what the UK was facing. And of course, for us, for the European Union, it was easier to reach out to our stakeholders because what we were saying is, well, guys, Brexit is taking place. No time for nostalgia. We are trying to mitigate negative consequences of the decision and on the british side it was impossible to even admit that there would be negative consequences of the decision to mitigate so um i think this was the the the, the reason for the secret but what strikes me uh, and not to put the blame on the uk because i always try to uh, think how it could happen to my home country or other european countries the UK has the best and brightest diplomats around the world, and I mean it. I'm sure that even when they were selling ideological talking points to us, they were also reporting on, on our answers. Uh, what was made of these reports? Because all too often I would meet with Theresa May or Boris Johnson or David Davis or uh, Dominic Raab, and they seemed not to be aware of the difficulties ahead not to be informed or not to be uh, uh, really involved in all the technicalities which were part of the negotiation. So all this knowledge competence from uh, the British diplomatic service was not really used to the benefit of the negotiation. This is my, my question. Thank hey, you. Now, Caroline, I'm just conscious that Terry has to leave us shortly. And I know that Leila wants to put a point about the potential impact of the German elections. And I, well, what time exactly, how, how soon do you have to leave, Terry? I still have five minutes, I guess. Five minutes. So I'm just anxious that we... Um, uh, I'll pass over to Leila. Is that all right? Oh, thank fine. you so much. Uh, Leila, would you like to come in? Leila oh, Moran. Thank you so much. Thank you, Terry, for your spare five minutes. I'll come to you first. Um, so obviously we've got the German elections concluding very soon. Um, and of course we've got the French presidency coming up and also the presidential elections. But from your perspective, I wanted to know, um, has the UK been mentioned at all in the course of the election campaign? Is it featuring or are we now just absolutely not on the agenda? Um, and sort of second to that, and we can't obviously predict the outcome other than it will be different to what was before. Um, but what's your best view of how 
uh, EU UK relations might, might change uh, as a result of the result of your election, Terry? Well, I think a little bit also reflecting on what Ursula von der Leyen said in the State of the Union, uh, I can tell you that the UK and Brexit was not really one of the main topics in the German election campaign. Uh, what, however, was a topic is obviously um, the future of the European Union, because I mean, we can talk a lot about how the negotiations went, but I think we also have to look at how do we actually want to build a European Union in the future, reflecting also on what happened with Brexit now. Um, and I think that there, I mean, we are in the, I think, good position that we have three candidates for the chancellery that, I mean, I obviously have a preference who's the best of them, but they are all very pro-European. And um, so I think that um, they are definitely um, going to want to build a government that then is going to uh, see where we can have better integration and what we can do to um, make the European Union stronger. And um, I also think that they are all uh, very open um, towards strong EU-UK relations. Um, and I mean, you could already see um, that now the trade relations between Germany and the UK, um, which I think from an economic point were always also very important for Germany, um, are deteriorating. Also the political relations, as we have spoken of, uh, the trust um, that has been broken. Um, so I hope that uh, no matter what the outcome in terms of the chancellery is going to be, and um, that we will have a German government that is going to invest in this. However, I can really see that the challenge will be to keep it on the agenda and to really also constantly remind not only the people in Brussels, not only the Commission, not only in the European Parliament, but also the governments of the member states, how important it is to continue to invest into the relations with the UK um, and not only to look at the US and China, because I still believe that the UK is a very uh, close partner and, you know, things can also change in the next 10, 15, 20 years again, and then maybe we are going to look at an even closer relationship again. So um, I think that um, they are all on the right track um, in terms of what they want for the UK, but I think keeping it in the minds of people and you know talking about how we can um, build a, a sustainable relationship in the future, that will be something that um, we all together have to work on. And I, I'm sorry, I have to leave now. I still wish you have a, a wonderful debate. Bye-bye. Uh, and hopefully see you, all, uh, see you all in the UK or in Glasgow at some point. Um, it would be fantastic. Terry, thank you very much for joining us today. All the best. Thanks, Bye. Terry. Now, Leila. Um, could I ask the same question of Natalie, but from the French perspective of the, the French presidency and also the, the French elections, which are further away, of course, but um, already gearing up. Well, uh, I have to say that uh, in France right now, it's a pre-electoral campaign. Uh, many things are debated, uh, not the UK and not Brexit. Uh, finally, uh, we, we, we managed to realize that Brexit had taken place uh, and that we are moving forward. Um, and I think it's good because when it becomes an electoral issue, uh, you have more polemics than uh, rational in the debate. Of course, if Marine Le Pen was to win the election first, uh, that would be a tragedy for France and for Europe. Um, she would probably um, be in trouble uh, because she was a, a strong uh, Brexiteer. She applauded to uh, the success of, of the Brexit party. Um, at some point, you even wondered whether she was defending the interests of uh, the French nationals or simply an ideology that she likes. But when you come to power, you have to defend the interests of your fellow citizens. And this is what brought us together from the Polish peace to Costa uh, in Portugal. Um, we may have very different political views throughout Europe, uh, from Salvini uh, in Italy, when he was uh, in power, never broke the unity of the 27 as regard Brexit, because uh, the basis of our position in the negotiation was protecting our citizens, protecting our businesses, protecting um, the single market, uh, freedom of movement, things that are really basics and that are debated by no one. Thank you very much. Um, Georgina, do you want to add anything on either of those upcoming events? 
I mean, or indeed the, the French presidency of the council is the other factor that's coming in, isn't it, in January? Yeah, um, I mean, very, very quickly, I think there are two aspects here. There's the process and the politics. The process is when it comes to Brexit or post-Brexit reality, uh, you know, France's view is very much that's led by the European Commission and the EU Commission's team that are dealing with be that the Northern Line Protocol or, or the sort of people involved in overseeing the TCA have the full backing of, of France. And if they feel that that's, you know, that the EU Commission is doing something they don't agree with, they'll, they'll say that, but they're very happy to let the Commission lead on that. So that's a process point. On the politics point, I mean, you know, Brexit was important, but it was never a priority for France and the EU. And I really think that's important to, to, to underline. And that was the case during the negotiations as well. There's a lot going on in the EU. Um, and if you look at the upcoming French presidency, I've, I've rarely seen as many EU big pieces of legislation being debated at the same time. So you've got the Green Deal, you've got this Global Compass, which is the, you know, potential white book outlining EU foreign policy. You've got Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act. I mean, these are huge and substantial pieces of legislation that are being debated at the same time. And, and that's where the focus is. And that's where the focus will be during the French presidency. Um, and then finally, to, you know, to, to kind of, you know, complete what Natalie was saying, um, I think the e, you know, foreign policy rarely figures in, in political campaigns, um, and you've seen it in Germany, the EU hasn't really figured that prominently. Um, uh, Macron, it's a bit different because obviously he made the EU a centre pillar um, of his, uh, you know, domestic and foreign policy. But of course, that's why when the continue, when the UK continues to talk about the EU through the Brexit prism, that's not necessarily, it doesn't really help. France kind of engaging uh, on UK EU relations. They're just thinking, as I think Lord Rickett said at the start, it's a problem at the moment. We'll just park it. Um, so I think you know the, the bilateral track will continue on defence and stuff like that. But anything to do with UK EU relations, let's let the Commission deal with that. Thank you hey, very much, Leila. Thank you very. Yes, to chair. <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed, Liz Savile Roberts. Liz. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my general question is asking about the pathway to better relations, but because time is short, and if you'll forgive me, I'm going to go straight into two specific questions in relation to this. Now, my first question, because I represent a constituency in Wales, is about the, the role of the devolved governments in the future. Given that we've talked about the tensions that presently exist between the UK government and the EU per se. Um, the devolved governments have representatives in Brussels, they have them in other cities across EU countries. Um, but I mean, specifically for Wales, our experience has been difficulties with Erasmus, difficulties with border checks towards Ireland. What role do you think the devolved governments might play in future? If I, Natalie, if I could start with you, please. Well, we meet quite often with representatives of devolved governments uh, in Brussels, and I think it's helpful uh, to get a, a, get a full picture of what's taking place in the UK and not only in London. I think what we have to do is go to the United Kingdom. First of all, go to Northern Ireland. And I, I, I really praise Maros Cesevic for having been there uh, in, in the last days. Uh, but we have to do it much more. And as member of the European Parliament, this is also our role to uh, continue the conversation and not let it hijacked by uh, ideology, to try to find solution, to get a, a proper sense of uh, what we can build on and uh, ideas and proposals that we put on the table at a moment where there is still too much uh, blame game against the, the EU uh, in the United Kingdom and there are uh, people throughout the United Kingdom who need to know what the uh, EU can provide. For instance, I'm struck that uh, on the Northern Ireland uh, protocol uh, issue, very few people say that today Northern Ireland has its cake and eats it. It is in the UK single market and it is in the EU single market. That's a huge opportunity for Northern Ireland. Who says that on the British side? Not many people. I think it's our role to tell them, well, after all, you're not the victims of the whole thing. You, are, you can become the winners. Thank you. And 
Georgina, do you have any anything to comment? I mean, particularly again, possibly Northern Ireland is in a particular situation. Scotland and Wales are in another situation. And speaking as a Europhile, um, I think you know, our, generally speaking, that our parliaments and our governments might well speak in a different way to the UK government. Um, thank you very much. I, I um, would point to a report that I wrote in my previous uh, life when I was at the Institute for Government. I wrote a report called um, Influencing the EU After Brexit. And we very much called on, on kind of the devolved administrations maintaining their links with, with the EU and that actually that was part of a Team UK approach. Of course, the difficulty is for some uh, areas of competency. The British government is the right interlocutor. For others, um, it will be the devolves and the British government. Um, but I think um, I would encourage uh, the devolved um, governments, but also you know the the assemblies and and, and parliaments to really participate in EU wide you know parliamentary conferences to have as many links as possible. It's important to maintain those, and it's good to have as many personal relationships as possible. Especially, I think if you feel that um, the UK position or the devolved position isn't as understood as it should be um, in the EU. Thank you very much. And my second question, and again, if I could start with Natalie. In your experience of the capacity and capability of UK non-government organisations, so this could be farming unions, industry lobbying groups, CBI, FSB, um, civil society organisations, their ability to engage effectively with the EU institutions. Now, we're moving into a new era. Do they need, do they have the expertise, so the non-government organisations, to be able to, to lobby effectively? If they don't, what do they need to do? Well, they have started to do so. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they were coming to us before to try to know what was the British position. So it was weird, but it was for us symbolic of the difficulties. <laughs> now they are coming back to us. Um, uh, listing their priorities, uh, their concerns, and, and, and the ways forward. Uh, and we pay a lot of attention because indeed, uh, even for our own uh, vital interests, improving relations with uh, businesses on the other side of the channel, improving exchanges with NGOs, with civil society, is something that we need. And I would mention that France especially needs we are very often portrayed as the bad cop of the European Union in the British media, just because we are vocal. Uh, we are vocal because other member states ask us to be. They say, well, if the French can say it, we, we are protected. Uh, but if we are still very much interested in everything Brexit related, it's because our relations with the United Kingdom are so intense that we don't want to see them hurt even more than they are already today. So indeed, we have to work with all stakeholders. They are, of course, welcome in Brussels, and we have to reach out and go and see them uh, on the ground, because I don't want it to be an insider conversation. What takes place in Brussels is, is, is important. But I think that we have to win hearts and minds and public opinion so that people realize that uh, it's in our common interest to do more and we are not there yet and and the media and the british media are not all helpful on this Je vous comprends. Merci beaucoup. Um, georgina again the, the capacity of uk lobbying groups are, are they really up to speed with what they need to be doing now with the eu could they be improved at all? I, I mean, you know, obviously it depends who you talk to, but um, but I think that was a missed opportunity at the beginning of the negotiations where, you know, you had big businesses that were active members of EU-wide associations who could have, you know, been an additional vehicle in explaining the UK government's position. And, and in, in researching my report on influencing the EU after Brexit, they said, well, for a very long time, we didn't really know what the government's position was. And so it was hard for us to not advocate for it, but at least try and explain uh, it. So it has to very much be a team UK approach in the future. And I think uh, the government realises this and has set up, you know, a number of, of kind of trade advisory groups now um, for different trade agreements. So I think that that's taking uh, shape. But yes, 
yes, I think they do continue. I mean, business business um, uh, adapt quickly to realities. Um, and, you know, I think particularly big businesses knew some of the change that would ensue from the TCA. And, you know, we're working uh, very much with their counterparts, trying to, they have good links, many of them to, to member state governments as well as, as, you know, MPs and then MEPs as well. So yes, I think that should continue. And I think some of them do have good links, but obviously it's not the case for smaller businesses. Thank you very much, Tihan. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed. We're now moving the focus of this session on to the future relationship. And we have been joined by uh, Ambassador Almeida. I just wonder if you would like to introduce yourself for the panel of the commissioners and also all the people who are uh, watching our discussions today. And it's a, a great pleasure to welcome you to our session, Ambassador. Well, good uh, good morning. Thank you very much for uh, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to reconnect with you, Hilary Ben. Uh, you've done great work in in Commons on all these issues, and uh, we were very pleased to to cooperate with you. Now, in this in this commission, I look forward to uh, to to the result of your work, and uh, more than willing to cooperate. I'm joined by. Uh, a fantastic panel of speakers whom I, I salute as well uh, and uh, so ready to contribute in whatever extent you wish uh, uh, useful. That is uh, really helpful. Now I'm, I've am i got a, a question I want to put because um, and I want to come first to you Peter Ricketts. You, you said earlier that for the relationship to change between the EU and the UK you said there would need to be a, a different cabinet to the one that we have at the moment. But I want to focus on a very specific issue, which is highly pertinent at the moment. And it's this. Uh, there is the red line of the British government, which includes not being subject to the European Court of Justice. The red line of the European Union, which the European Court of Justice is the determinant of whether the rules of the single market are being upheld. And in any other trade relationship between two countries, you would not have the court of one party adjudicating on disputes about the interpretation of the agreement. And therefore, my question to you is, what is the way out of this on pass? Um, and are the arrangements that are in the TCA to do with the level playing field, where the same argument took place, but in the end, the negotiators found a way which said, well, either side can say you're not abiding by the rules and take unilateral measures. It is, might that form the basis of a new and a better relationship on something like a, a veterinary agreement, which is highly relevant to the current difficulties when it comes to trade with Northern Ireland? Wow. Well, that is... That is a very technical question indeed, and one for the lawyers. Uh, and of course, it was central to the uh, negotiation in all sorts of different domains. Um, I, I think it, they did reach a, a kind of solution uh, in the uh, part three of the TCA uh, on internal security and justice, um, which I mean provides for arbitration, apart from anything else, yeah. which, which is a, an important first step in all these things. Um, and in terms of the jurisdiction of the ECJ, I mean, what the UK will never be able to change is that the ECJ will adjudicate on uh, EU laws as they apply in the EU. And that, that's that's clear, um, but won't adjudicate on uh, what applies in the UK. So it's always going to be a, an awkward uh, fix. I don't think there's ever going to be a neat way around it. I think the sort of conclusion that um, each side has the sovereign right to diverge if it wishes, but then has to take the consequences of that in terms of reduced access or uh, increased controls, uh, regulations, is probably the only way. Um, but the complicated arrangements for consultation and arbitration, for example, set out in the Northern Ireland Protocol, don't seem to me to be of use, to be used as much as they should have been before at least one side reached for the, for the threat instrument, the threat of suspension uh, or withdrawal. So given goodwill, those sort of slightly um, uh, nuanced and conditional um, ways of tackling the problem are the right ones. Um, but I don't think there's any cut and dried solution to this issue, um, which applies particularly in the uh, free trade agreement with the UK, I think because of the scale and intensity of our economic and 
um, social relations across the channel. It's a much closer relationship than any other that the EU has with third countries. And therefore, um, the arrangements on the, um, uh, the judicial side are always going to be more complex, I think. But that's a layman's answer, Hillary, to an extremely important question. Well, thank you, Peter. Now, Ambassador, yes, I wanted to come to you. Yes, uh, uh, this was not in my initial list of questions that you asked. <laughs> I know, but I'm I seizing cannot, the opportunity. I cannot refrain from uh, from uh, uh, reacting to it because I think there's a need for a, a very important clarification here. Uh, what you were referring about <laughs> discussion with with UK and everything that Lord Ricketts said is, is of course valid, but. Uh, you refer to this discussion about the ECJ today. It is about Northern Ireland. It is not about the TCA in general. It's about the withdrawal agreement and the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. And why is this important to clarify this? Is because Northern Ireland, differently from GB, the rest of the UK, has access to the single market for goods. So in order to protect and preserve that uh, element of our protocol. The fact that we wanted to guarantee that Northern Ireland could have access to the single market so that we don't need to put a hard border between the Republic and Northern Ireland. There has to be jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. There is no internal market without Court of Justice. The choice was made by the two of us uh, UK and the EU to have this protocol as the solution for the problems created by Brexit to the situation of Northern Ireland. One of the elements of this solution is to provide access at Northern Ireland to the internal market of the European Union to avoid an harsh border, hard border with the South. In order to guarantee that, we need the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. I think that this is. Uh, clear. Uh, I hope that this is understood uh, because uh, I see uh, an incompa incompatibility, if I can say that in bad English, between having access to the internal market for goods and, and not being submitted to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. So uh, I think in a, in a simple way, this uh, sort of puts the discussion on the right, on the right basis. Ambassador, thank you very much uh, indeed. I'm sorry to throw that in, but we're um, we're going to explore some of these issues in the remaining part of the session. I'm now going to turn to Professor Alan Winters. Alan. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Hilary, and uh, thank you, panel members. Um, I'm, I'm wanting to look to the future and, and ask, just really by a way of um, uh, fact, yeah, how is the EU organized for future UK discussions? And in particular, if any significant issues come up, I mean, is the EU going to have to create mandates and appoint new negotiators? Or is it something that the current structures, in a sense, can handle in a um, pragmatic way? Although I understand that word is a bit devalued at the moment. Let me perhaps ask the ambassador, Ambassador Almeida, if you'd answer first of all. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for your question. Um, I'll, I'll try to be short. It is clear that we have a, a set of agreements. We are now international law, the UK law, EU law, uh, and uh, our purpose now is to implement them properly and fully. Uh, the TCA covers a wide range of areas and, uh, and uh, has foreseen a number of bodies, joint bodies that will govern this relationship. They are beginning to meet for the first time. We will have between now and Christmas uh, dozens of meetings of all these committees. They are what I call the engine room of this uh, new uh, uh, relationship, particularly as far as uh, economic matters uh, are concerned. Uh, so the bulk of our discussions from now on will take place within these committees and with the top structure of it, the Joint uh, uh, Partnership Council, co-chaired by Mara Shevchovic and, and David Frost. So this is the the, the structure we have, and that's through that structure that uh, discussions will take place. We have parallel to that for the withdrawal agreement, the joint committee, same kind of conception, uh, same actors, uh, where and also specialized committee. So there's a whole uh, paraphernalia of, of bodies that uh, and tools that will allow us to manage this relationship in the best uh, possible 
possible way. And it is clear for us, uh, just to put any doubts to rest, that we are not about to renegotiate any of these agreements that we just concluded uh, with the United Kingdom. This being said, there are a number of areas that were foreseen to be negotiated later, typically uh, on Gibraltar, for instance, or in agreements in other specific areas where, uh, of course, arrangements need to be uh, made, uh, uh, if need be, for, for those. But the bulk of our discussions will, uh, will run through the mechanisms that have been created within TCA and the withdrawal agreement. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Natalie, Lazo, do you have anything, any further reflection on that? Yes, uh, on the side of the European Parliament, uh, during the negotiation first of the withdrawal agreement and then uh, of the ECA, we had what we call the UK coordination group, uh, uh, where our representative of political groups were meeting on a regular basis, where the interlocutors of Michel Barnier uh, and uh, the rest of the parliament would trust us uh, to uh, build the position of the European Parliament uh, on Brexit. Some of us uh, were naive enough to think that after ratifying the uh, TCA, that would be the end of the story. I was not one of them, and I, I, I repeated that the UK would not become simply a, a topic for the Foreign Affairs Committee full point, and that we would still need to coordinate uh, the position of the European Parliament on everything Brexit related. Unfortunately, I was right. So now I am a member of the UK contact group, which keeps on uh, having discussions with Maros Cevcovic uh, and with a number of stakeholders. We are creating the uh, EU-UK delegation in the European Parliament. It's uh, the working progress and we will be part of the parliamentary assembly, which is um, foreseen in the, uh, in the TCA. And I look forward to it because I definitely think that apart from all the committees, uh, which uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Dan Maida just described, uh, there is uh, an important role for uh, members of parliaments of, on both sides to try to uh, engage in uh, 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 quiet and uh, constructive conversation and we stand ready to do this. Thank you very much. If Georgina will forgive me, I'll perhaps pass back to the chair in the, the name of time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed, Alan. Uh, next, uh, Sir Roger Gale. Roger. Thank, thanks very much, Hilary. Um, I've picked up on a degree of criticism of Theresa May um, for secretiveness and the degree of antipathy as well towards her. I have to say that's not an antipathy that I share. Nevertheless, um, I don't think anybody could accuse Lord Frost of being secretive. He seems to conduct his, um, his negotiations via the megaphone. And I just wonder what the effect of that public criticism of the EU by the UK government spokesman uh, is does that increase suspicion of the UK's motives or is it water off a duck's back? Um, Peter Ricketts. Well, I shall be interested in uh, Natalie's comment about that. I think my own observation is that the French and others are entirely used to uh, criticism in the French tabloid media, for example. Um, and uh, you know, I suspect it is to an extent water off a duck's back, but I think they tend to see the way that these points are being made publicly rather than uh, through the negotiating channels um, as a bit of a proof that a lot of the purpose here is playing to the gallery in the UK rather than seriously seeking to resolve the problem. That's it. That's the trouble, I think. I think that then comes back to the issue we were talking about of trust and confidence. Um, it's a little bit like the Prime Minister choosing the G7 summit in Cornwall to have a public row with Emmanuel Macron about the supply of sausages to Northern Ireland. It, it does tend to make people think that a large part of the purpose of talking to the EU is to be able to report back to, to the base that um, you know a, a good row was had and, and Britain uh, laid down the law. So um, I don't think now that we are in a period where we have to persuade an influence from the outside 
that megaphone diplomacy is good. I mean, I what I was saying about Theresa May was that she was secretive even with her own side, as far as I can gather, that everything was so tightly held that other spokesmen for the British government uh, didn't really know where the negotiations were. This is about well, using the press to try to put pressure on the other side. I, I, don't, I don't think that works. Um, yes, I, I think my own experience of that is that um, the cards were played close to the chest in the interests of reaching an agreement that was conducted with, through negotiations that were conducted in private rather than through the megaphone. Natalie, what's your view of all this? Well, uh, to be honest, um, to be a, a dedicated Anglophile is not something so popular for a French politician uh, these days. And it's true throughout Europe. When you say that we have to do more, that we have to fix problems, and that we have to engage with the United Kingdom on, on common challenges, people stare at you and tell you, you really want to talk with these guys. Um, and you have to say, well, leave aside uh, tabloid literature, leave aside posturing for domestic consumption. And definitely there are things that we have to do in common. But what really doesn't help is that uh, when there are lost opportunities like G7, which could have been a fresh start and became a conversation about sausages. Uh, when uh, we learned about uh, extension of grace periods, not throughout the uh, dedicated committees, but in the press, when we have a discussion with Maros Shevchovic in the UK contact group, and at the very same moment, uh, Lord Frost threatens to trigger Article 16. Well, we had our old blunder with Article 16, and I was extremely angry at the European Commission at that time, uh, because they were engaging in exactly what is unhelpful in our relations. But the, the mistake was fixed uh, in a few hours. Uh, but really, uh, it doesn't help. Uh, our public opinions keep on repeating to us, leave them, uh, don't bother answering their uh, screams, be tough, resist, instead of let's try to build something positive. Um, so really a changing tone uh, would help people who really are trying to find solutions. Yes, I think a change in tone sometimes has to be two-sided. I'm not sure that Monsieur Macron is always um, backward in coming forward on these matters. Georgina, what's your view of this? Thank you, Sir Roger, and I agree. Sometimes it's good to, to look at what the EU is doing as well. Um, I mean, to be honest, I think most people have moved on, and it's kind of what I said at the beginning. Since moving to Paris, no one ever talks about Brexit. Um, even when there was the, the issue in Jersey, um, it was quite limited. Um, and and also, I think when people do pay attention, because it's still very much a uh, confrontational tone, a bit antagonistic, that it just seems to place a bit of boredom. And, and it's kind of the sense of, well, we'll, we'll come back once this is passed. Maybe this is just the politics at the moment. Um, but I think that's, that's worrying. Um, because the longer this goes on, uh, you know, the, the, the riskier it is that that actually both sides just don't understand, uh, you know, what their positions are. And I think if, you know, to take Terry's point, very valid point earlier when she said, you know, the State of the Union speech by President von der Leyen didn't mention the UK once, and that was silly, maybe they should have. But it kind of again shows the sort of the complexity of that the negotiation of UK EU relations is still def definitely through the Brexit prism and it needs to move beyond that. Um, and I just as an anecdote, um, I, I remember talking to one of my colleagues who said, you know, it's only, there are only the British who think that every morning the French wake up worrying about what's happening in the UK and what the UK thinks of France. We don't, we have other things to do. And I think it's just important for that context. I hope we can move on beyond that. I think that both sides need to talk to each other. There's a lot that they can do in the integrated review talks about you know, the UK and EU cooperating in areas of mutual interest. Um, but I think at the moment that's very difficult given some of the confrontational tone and, and some of the issues that still need to be resolved. Thanks. Um, I've got a big red note here that says not for the ambassador. My impression is that diplomats are normally quite good at diplomacy, but um, if you want to comment in a minute, you can do so, sir. Um, 
Moving forward, though, um, the UK obviously is now outside the regular meetings of the European Union, although we do have other platforms through, for example, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and indeed the Council of Europe itself. Um, but how much of this lack of contact is a loss to both sides? And uh, are the ways of are the concerns about having informal meetings, for example, with the United Kingdom? Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm not afraid of any question. And, uh, I thought you I might not be. <laughs> the previous one is is an interesting one, but I have my 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 limits in terms of my uh, capacity to do so. But if I go back to your previous question, just not to uh, to avoid it, uh, I think uh, we and I've been advocating that for some time. We need to uh, try to change the mindset in our in our discussion, uh, in order to look forward instead backwards, in in order to try to build bridges instead of um, you know scoring points on past battles and, and and that's what we are doing right now if you look at the recent events regarding the most difficult file which is northern ireland we have as european union scaled down our our action we have paused our our legal uh, uh, infringement uh, procedures in order to find and create time and space for exactly uh, uh, what uh, I think we need now is to pause and, and try to find solutions for the problems. And, and that's how we try to contribute in, in a positive way. And that's what we're doing as we speak, uh, discussing with our British friends ways and means to find uh, practical solutions to alleviate the burden on, on citizens and, and, and business in Northern Ireland, which were, never forget, uh, initially provoked by by Brexit and uh, and the withdrawal from the single market and the customs union. Regarding your second question, uh, you know, I think it's obvious for us, and it's certainly my personal position that Brexit is a lose-lose uh, situation. Uh, I think we lose on both sides, um, uh, but of course, we, as much as we regret the decision, we fully respect it. So our purpose now is to is to limit the damage created by Brexit and potentiate. Uh, the, the the good things that the TCA can bring to uh, to, to 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 all of us. So uh, the loss is 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 on both sides. Uh, you know, for for you British people to assess the degree of loss on your side. On our side, we lose an, a, an important member of the European Union, a, a an international uh, important actor. Uh, and uh, but we have, we have to move forward. And 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 the state of mind, as as uh, Georgina was uh, referring earlier is very much uh, uh, that of, of moving forward and, and trying to uh, uh, you know, deal with the, the tools that we have. And I think the TCA has an enormous potential, but beyond TCA, and I think that's the purpose of your question, I think we can and we should develop mechanisms of cooperation of dialogue on, on issues of common interest. And, and, and I think the reality will force us in that direction, to be very frank. If I take climate, if I take the post-Afghanistan situation, if I take relationship with the important partners like Russia or China, if I take Iran, if I take the, 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 the rebalancing of our relationship with the United States, on all those fronts, uh, you will find a lot of common ground between us and the United Kingdom. Uh, what we need to do is to be sort of uh, adult enough and mature enough to, to accept that uh, we need and we must continue to cooperate in a different uh, uh, set of circumstances in a different environment because it is different to be in or to be out and this should be clearly understood but uh, uh, regardless of that i think uh, all points in the direction of uh, us moving forward uh, finding uh, informal or more formal ways of cooperating certainly within the tca and the agreement but i would say even uh, beyond that and uh, i will try to modestly contribute to that that's very helpful and very refreshing. Georgina. Uh, thank you very much, Roger. Um, I mean, completely agree with what's just been said. There's obviously what happens around discussions around the TCA, and those are very much going to happen within that joint committee structure that exists. But for everything else, um, you know, be that climate change or cooperation on sanctions and all the rest of it, the UK and EU will need to find a way to, um, you know, uh, discuss these things formally but also informally and and it exists you know if you look at 
Um, there are a number of EU um, council meetings at ministerial level or even at official level um, where on the fringes they'll invite you know neighbouring countries to come and contribute. So that happens already. There's something called a gimnig uh, where it's the Foreign Affairs Council um, that meets informally. Um, so it's all the EU 27 foreign ministers and then sometimes they'll invite foreign ministers from Norway, from Switzerland, from Turkey. So it has happened in the past and those are opportunities that should be seized upon. But of course, it's not just up to the government. Um, it's very much, a, you know, parliament to parliament relations, uh, business, uh, civil society. Again, I've, I've mentioned this report before and I'm sorry to be plugging it again, but my report on influencing the EU after Brexit just shows multiple ways that, that we can have these informal discussions to make sure that if we're not going to cooperate, at least we understand uh, what each other's position is. And of course, um, I can't help myself, but I think the embassy, and I'm not saying that because the ambassador's there, but obviously the embassy plays a crucial role in conveying <laughs> the state of the British UK debate about the EU and so favouring, you know, not only um, reaching, reaching out to people who are, are based um, elsewhere in Europe, but also very much using people who are um, and speaking to the people who are based in London and in the UK is very important as well. OK, uh, Roger, we'll need to move on if that's OK. okay. Now, thank you very much for that. Uh, next, uh, it's Anatol Kaletsky. Anatol. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so uh, the ambassador said we should move on. And my question is really about how we move on to a uh, new and uh, different relationship in the long term. Uh, and I'd like to know really what are the EU's uh, priorities for a future relationship with what uh, will, after all, be its biggest and is its biggest and most important neighbor. Uh, earlier in, in, in this discussion, uh, we mentioned how it was a big missed opportunity by Theresa May, uh, who could have sought, after, even after the referendum, an EEA or EFTA or perhaps Swiss type of relationship. If that were to become possible uh, in British politics in the long run, would that be welcomed by uh, Europe? Or is there a feeling in Europe that actually the EU has become more cohesive and more effective as a result of Brexit, and perhaps a distant relationship is more desirable? Uh, you know, perhaps the ambassador could primarily answer that question, and we'll see. Thank you very much. Time. Thank you very much. I'm sure uh, yourself and you know, the members of panel and those who have diplomatic experience know that the rule number one of a good diplomat is not to comment on hypothetical scenarios and uh, and uh, and uh, you've you've referred to a number of them which are linked to national uh, decisions uh, on which i don't wish to comment but uh, uh, you know every relationship is a living relationship and and it evolves between people and between countries and uh, and uh, and i'm sure this will be the case as well i don't know which direction i think our priority now and you ask for our priority our priority is to make this relationship work under new circumstances. It will be different and there should be no illusions. Sometimes I see some illusions there that you can, you can be out and still have some of the privileges of being in. Uh, that, that is unfortunately not possible. Uh, we came to very creative solutions regarding Northern Ireland, but the rest is what is in the, in, in the treaties and that we need to, to, to implement. But, uh, and that's our first priority, make this relationship work, make the withdrawal agreement and the TCA with all its potential. And I refer to, to the machinery that is going to run it. We need to make this uh, operation work to the benefit of our citizens and our uh, businesses. And in the, in, the, in the context of this implementation and, and, and the increased uh, discussion, I'm sure we will find on one side some problems that we had not foreseen. Uh, that will come up, and uh, Madame Loiseau was referring to her anticipation of the fact that Brexit will not go away, and I agree with her that this relationship is so intense on all fronts that problems will arise that were not foreseen, and, and maybe potential for a good cooperation will, will also appear and lead us to, to a more positive territory in, in some areas. So I think we need to be open-minded to, to it, uh, and that's, the, that's where we are. Uh, right now. One thing that we don't want to do and we don't think we should do is to talk about renegotiation or to talk about opening uh, issues that have been thoroughly discussed 
and for which uh, we did not find any uh, uh, more viable uh, alternative. Uh, our approach is to move forward, look forward in a positive uh, uh, spirit with a positive mindset. And that's what I hope for this relationship. Anatole, we can't, you're still on mute. Ah, there you are. Uh, yeah. Is there perhaps uh, time, uh, Hilary, for Natalie to, uh, yes, uh, uh, to uh, comment on this question on that of the question. longer term relationship from the French point of view? Yeah. And if yes, there was a moment, I wouldn't mind a word as well, possibly. Okay, well, we've, uh, we've got about three minutes for, for your two contributions. So, Natalie first. I try to be brief. I was a former diplomat, but I'm a politician, so I'm a little bit, a little bit freer than uh, my, my dear friend, the ambassador, to, to, to speak my mind. Uh, of course, it's a loss. Of course, not having the UK with us. I was listening to Ursula von der Leyen yesterday, listing our priorities. Uh, climate change, digital, sovereignty, yours, health, defense. They are British priorities as well. They are challenges that we have to face but we're not facing them exactly together. So that's a minus. But to be very honest, there are things that we are doing right now on which we wonder whether we were able to do them if the uh, UK was still a member state. I'm thinking of the recovery package. I'm thinking on progress on European defense uh, on which, uh, well, the UK was not always very uh, enthusiastic when it was a member state. So we have to mitigate uh, uh, and work with the, the, the two things. The UK uh, is a third state out of its own choice. And uh, the type of Brexit which was chosen is a pretty hard Brexit, but it's a special uh, third state and we have to uh, find solutions. You know that, for instance, uh, the uh, European Intervention Initiative, which was triggered by France, includes the UK and uh, discussions or thoughts about a European Security Council should involve the UK, there is no doubt about it. As a French, I miss the uh, capacity to think global that not that many member states have in Europe. Peter. Um, in one minute, um, I very much agree with the ambassador that the first step is to make work what we've got and what we signed up for, which is a way of rebuilding confidence on both sides. Um, and uh, that uh, is, a, is a point of departure. I think the mindset should be that the TCA is a floor, not a ceiling to the relationship. And as trust rebuilds over time, and it will take time, then it will be possible to extend it. But uh, it won't if one side is not confident that the other will stick to its word. And I think in that sort of period, before we can start to build on top of the TCA, working together on third issues where both sides have got key interests is vital. And I would just put climate change on the table. I mean, the Glasgow uh, Climate Summit is now a mere six weeks away, uh, and the EU and the UK have very, very common interests in that. So the more we can help solve problems outside the EU working together, that will all help to build confidence, ready for um, some reconstruction when that becomes possible. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Anatole. Right, uh, now um, I'm going to bring in Claire Hanna. Claire. Thank, thank you very much, um, Chair. Uh, a very interesting session. Um, obviously, Northern Ireland is, is is sensitive in the in the Brexit context and very uh, very complex. Um, the root problem is that many of our own elected representatives here don't understand the challenges um, and the risks. But um, I wanted to ask about the continuing level of understanding of those complexities within the EU. Uh, for, for what it's worth, I think. Um, most in business and and elected representatives have been really impressed at the level of engagement and understanding particularly in the commission in uh and by barnier and subsequently shefkovich's and their teams um but do you think those complexities 
are are widely understood. Um, uh, I, I suppose through the the political teams of other members, we obviously had the um, near miss triggering in in um, in January, which has been ruthlessly, um, I suppose, distorted. Um, uh, by, by, by those seeking to undermine the protocol. Um, but is there a risk of um, frustration or boredom about having to grapple with the complexities of Northern Ireland? Georgina spoke in an earlier answer about, I suppose, the fact that people have moved on. Um, is that going to be a problem that people sort of think we, we, have, we have sorted out the Northern Ireland problem and they don't have the, um, I suppose, bandwidth to, to continue to to get their head around um, the complexities. Um, Ambassador, could I come to you first on that question, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the, the, the question. Uh, Northern Ireland is top of my uh, in tray. I can get to you. I just came out of the Northern Ireland. It was my second visit, and I have not visited much because of COVID. My first visit out of London since my appointment, after my appointment, was to Northern Ireland. And I was there for the second time, this time for the first visit of Maros Shevskovic. And I can tell you that this, this is a, a good illustration of our commitment to Northern Ireland. And uh, it's a complex situation, uh, as we all know. So, uh, uh, you know, it's good that we go, it's good that we talk. We saw all, all the political leaders, including your friend, uh, your leader uh, in, 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 in Belfast, uh, Colm, a good friend, and doing a a good contribution to this file, uh, as many as all the other leaders. And uh, we met business people, extremely interesting meetings there. So the, the EU on our side, uh, we are committed to the peace and prosperity process, the Good Friday Agreement. We've always been there. We continue to be there. I visited a number of projects of the Peace Plus where we are on the ground with the two communities trying to sort of really building the building blocks of, of peace and reconciliation in Northern Ireland, and we now within the, the framework, post-Brexit framework, trying to find the right solutions for the protocol. But uh, uh, you're right, it's a complex uh, question. Uh, uh, sometimes I need to be pedagogical towards Brussels as well, because you know people have different degrees of knowledge about Northern Ireland, but I can guarantee you that on our side, I don't want to comment on the UK government's uh, position on this, but on our side, uh, fully committed to uh, to Northern Ireland, uh, top priority, and we want particularly this protocol to work because it's an, uh, an important element uh, of the overall relationship with the United Kingdom. Thank you. N Natalie, could you, could you comment on the same thing, I suppose, um, outside of the political core within the members? D is, is, is patience potentially wearing thin? Um, I think uh, everybody uh, paid a lot of attention to Northern Ireland uh, since the beginning of the negotiation of the withdrawal agreement. I mean, time was spent to try to draft the backstop and then the Northern Ireland protocol. And uh, all the stakeholders involved deeply in the specificities and the tensions and the risks. Uh, that are uh, specific to, to Northern Ireland. And this notion that we have to protect the Good Friday Agreement, which was a success due notably to uh, the involvement of the European Union, uh, and the fact that we are not only talking about trade, uh, but also about people uh, and about communities and, and, and a political uh, situation which is very difficult, uh, is in everybody's mind. Is it at the core of uh, the priorities of member states on a daily basis, no. But we know that uh, we have to make it work. But we have to make work what we decided in common. And this is the Northern Ireland Protocol, because we've been through all possible options uh, until we found this equilibrium. Uh, and uh, we won't know exactly what to do until the protocol is fully implemented uh, and um, uh, we, we, we see uh, what remains to be done. Um, Maros Shevchovic indeed was in Belfast recently. Uh, he's working on a number of proposals. He's been working on this uh, since uh, before the summer. Uh, so yes, there is a lot of attention. There is a lot of interest. Do we understand everything uh, that would be uh, uh, naive to say that we are doing our best? 
uh, we are very united and very solid with the Republic of Ireland because they are the first to see consequences of, 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 and of the risks and, and tensions. But yes, we are doing our, our best. I think that there is one more thing that we should do, and this would be to discuss with uh, stakeholders in uh, Northern Ireland because uh, they will they are becoming rule takers of what is being decided uh, in the European Union because they belong to our uh, single market. Uh, and I think that we have to do our part to explain first the benefits, but also where we are heading to and pay attention and take time and uh, show respect for Stormont and for all stakeholders in Northern Ireland. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, Lord Ricketts, Peter, do, do you, um, uh, do you see a, a, a similar level of understanding and um, commitment on the UK side to um, the delicacies of Northern yes. Ireland? In a word, no. Um, indeed, I think there's an astonishing ignorance about the realities and the nuances of Northern Ireland outside a specialist circle. I mean, there are clearly specialists in London and Westminster who understand it, uh, and, and many people in Northern Ireland understand it, but no, in the wider UK public debate, I think there's enormous ignorance. Indeed, I don't really recall Northern Ireland figuring in the referendum campaign very much at all. Uh, and so the complexities hit everyone afterwards. And I think that is a real problem. Um, I think on the EU side, I was very encouraged to hear what the ambassador said. It's such a priority for him. Uh, and I think Natalie's last point is really important, that the businesses and consumers in Northern Ireland are actually part of the EU single market and need to be treated as stakeholders as such. Um, I think it's probably inevitable that um, the EU will tend to look at the problem through the prism of Dublin, because Dublin is a member state. Um, but I, I think it's impressive how much effort the, um, the specialists have made to understand Northern Ireland. Nonetheless, I'm left with the feeling that the protocol was a very competent technical uh, effort to solve essentially political problems, intensely political problems in Northern Ireland. And I'm not sure that they will ever entirely work in um capturing all the political sensitivities in northern ireland so this is going to be something we continue to live with but no i, I wish that the knowledge and uh, interest frankly in the issues of northern ireland was more widely spread in british public debate now claire i'm afraid we're going to have to move on if that's okay thank you very much for your questions um aidan connolly the floor is yours thank you very much chair uh Ambassador, it's nice to see you again twice in two weeks. People are going to start talking. <laughs> uh, Madame Lezo, it's nice to see you as well. Actually, I, I had something pop up uh, at the start of the week, uh, which was a photo of us in my timeline. Um, three years uh, this week since, since I last saw you in person. It's lovely to see you. I'm going to, again, talk about the protocol uh, and, and about Northern Ireland. Um, what I would like to know is whether or not the re there can be a renegotiation or there can be a re uh, engagement with the protocol should that be with an annex or a codicil or something else to provide that removal of friction and um, that northern ireland uh, business and northern Ireland communities uh, so desperately uh, want again i am very grateful for the uh, level of of um engagement that we're having with with both sides at the moment and, and especially uh, with, with the EU, the specialised committee members and, and um, Lord, or, sorry, uh, Vice President Shevchevich um, being over a, a couple of weeks ago was, was, was very, very uh, welcome. But that, that's kind of where we are now as, as, as Northern Ireland, wondering what can be done as far as both sides. I'm actually going to start this time with, with Lord Ricketts um, as far as where he sees the landing zone for, for the UK is, what more can the UK do? And then I, I would like to go to uh, Ambassador Almeida. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed, Aidan. Uh, and I am <clears throat> far from being a specialist on Northern Ireland, so I will be very interested in the ambassador's answer. I mean, my own feeling is that there is no scope really for a root and branch renegotiation of the protocol at this point. I mean, having only signed it less than two years ago, after uh, all the work that went into looking at alternative solutions, <clears throat> it's a very fine balance of interest between the two sides. I think, for my part, <coughs> excuse me. I think that the um, uh, the print the priority ought to be to make it work to use the 
arbitration mechanisms to get a real discussion going between the two sides on the complexities rather than through the megaphone, um, but not um, imagine that a renegotiation of the protocol <coughs> is going to be possible. And, and since I seem to be losing my voice, I'm going to hand over to the ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Aidan. Uh, uh, nice to see you again. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to, to engage with you, and I, I praise all your efforts to, to try to find uh, solutions together with your uh, business uh, colleagues in, in Northern Ireland. Let, let me say, uh, my, my reply to your question on, on renegotiation is the following. A short answer, no. Uh, long answer, uh, we need to find ways and means within the protocol to address the problems that uh, uh, you have uh, extensively uh, uh, presented to us in, in, in different meetings and that we have discussed with our British colleagues. This solution, as Lord Ricketts was mentioning, was shaped, agreed, signed and ratified uh, by both sides. Very recently. The, the ink is not even dry on, on this. So, um, and, and it is the result of a careful balance of different interests and different uh, dimensions. And it is also the result of the fact that we didn't find any alternative to this protocol, able to, to, to do what I call the squaring of the circle in Northern Ireland, which is to protect the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, protect the, the integrity of the constitutional order of, uh, of the United Kingdom and the integrity of the single market. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure if there had been an alternative, we would have found them. Uh, and, uh, and so if we remove the protocol, uh, uh, some people mentioned that, not in order matter, by the way, I didn't hear anyone uh, suggesting to scrap the protocol, but uh, removing the protocol will not solve any issue. Uh, the protocol is in fact the solution for the problems created by Brexit. Uh, and failing to apply the protocol will simply take away the tools to solve those problems. So we believe that the, the solution for those problems should and can be found within the limits of the protocol. And that's exactly what we are doing right now. As I said earlier, we did our best to create space and time for the kind of discussions we had uh, two weeks ago in, in Northern Ireland, the kind of discussions that are taking place as we speak between our teams, so that we can, um, you know, somewhere in the fall, uh, try to reach an understanding on, on steps that we can take to address uh, the problems in a, in a practical, pragmatic uh, and constructive way. This is where, what are we, we are focusing now. A full renegotiation, as Maros Shevskovic said in Belfast, would only create instability, uncertainty, and, and predictability, which is exactly what you, Aidan, and your colleagues from business told me, told us that you do not want. Thank you. I just want to go to uh, Natalie, please. Um, is France um, and, and the other member states, but particularly France, are, are you willing to, are, are the French willing to move and, and, and be pragmatic on this as well? I think pragmatism has always been our key word, but pragmatism doesn't mean that you forget about your previous commitments. On the contrary, pragmatism means, as uh, the ambassador just said, that you provide certainty, previsibility uh, to uh, all the stakeholders. We have not yet seen a full implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And it's already blamed for things that it's supposed to create, whereas the solutions have not been triggered yet. So let's work uh, with goodwill, good faith. Um, let's address every specific single issue uh, and you're instrumental in this, in, in raising uh, the, the problems that have to be uh, dealt with. You know that the EU has made uh, offers on medicine uh, uh, on sanitary controls very concrete day-to-day uh, -day concerns of people in northern ireland and this can be done within the protocol so let's work on this let's stop posturing uh let's not be the hostage of political games where uh, the situation of citizens is key and we will never give up on protecting our single market this is something that i'm sure everybody bears in mind, but it's even better to repeat it. Thank you very much. Chair, back to you. 
Thank you very much uh, indeed, Aidan. Right, we now come to our uh, final question I'd like to put to all of you, because we have, Brexit has happened, we've spent the morning discussing what the future relationship between the UK and the EU might look like. What uh, improvements, where would you start to try and rebuild that, to build that new relationship? Um, and I was going to start with you, Peter. There's been talk about performing artists, uh, a veterinary agreement. There, there are lots of things that have been discussed and debated. What would you mm -hmm. identify briefly as the areas mm -hmm. it might be prudent to begin with and in the process to build mm -hmm. trust on both sides? Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you for this whole session, which has been really fascinating. I mean, not just because I'm an, an old diplomat, but I, I would say foreign policy. Uh, okay. Britain and the EU look out at the world from the same perspective. We have the same interests. We were both humiliated by American decisions on Afghanistan. Uh, we are approaching issues like the climate change uh, conference the same way. Uh, that is an area which should be low political risk. It should be in the interests of all sides. Let's, as Natalie said, take up the offer of uh, the European um, Security Council of debating security and de defence issues with EU partners as they think about autonomy. That seems to be a natural area to begin the process of reconnecting uh, in the interests of both sides. I think all the others, the closer you get to the economic and social relationship, the more the ideology and the political difficulties kick in. So much as I would like to see individual issues like veterinary issues or right of musicians and performing artists to move around Europe to be eased or Erasmus, I think those are all more difficult than starting on the foreign policy agenda. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Georgina. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I begin by saying it's going to be very difficult to do that without trying to resolve or at least improve um, some of the difficulties around the Northern Ireland Protocol. So I think that's going to be the number one priority. But then I think we need to be actively trying to rebuild trust before we try and improve the, the TCA. Um, and I completely agree with Lord Ricketts. It starts off obviously with, um, you know, foreign policy is, is like a not an easy one, but but because we see eye to eye on many issues, it, it should make that uh, dialogue easier. But there are other areas like space, for example, you could think of, of climate change, which the ambassador mentioned, uh, but also working together, um, be that UK EU or UK EU 27 uh, through the OECD um, in other international organisations. So I think, you know, there are lots of issues around governance, around international law, um, and also, you know, tax, for example, taxing, you know, big companies, digital companies, that's something that came out in the OECD, that came out in the G7, that came out in the G20. Um, and I think those are, are ways that you can EU or the UK and EU countries can continue to talk and try and rebuild that trust. And finally, then you, you come to improving the deal itself. And I think there are lots of you know, potential ways that you could simplify some of the rules around the checks um, and paperwork required um, for imports and exports, but also things like you know mutual recognition of professional qualifications, uh, movement of services suppliers, um, you know recognition of conformity assessments, and all of that. But I I don't think we can really get there until there's more trust and until we've resolved the Northern Ireland Protocol and for the EU and EU countries a uh, uh, um, clear uh, view that the UK is trying to meet the commitments that it signed up to. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Natalie? Well, of course I will go back to foreign policy because uh, it was included in the uh, political declaration and uh, it's still very much needed. Of course, Afghanistan shows us that we have to do things together. Um, but uh, And the terrorist threat that is getting higher because of uh, the victory of Taliban. Uh, on sanctions regimes, we have to coordinate closely um, on foreign interferences as well. China, Russia uh, have unfriendly behaviors going through disinformation or cyber attacks. And these are things that are, are as contagious as a, a virus and we are stronger fighting against them together. But I also would like to go back to something more basic. Let us not forget about citizens' rights 
It was one of the first things we discussed when we negotiated the withdrawal agreement. Uh, and it's not all that uh, uh, well set up as uh, it's supposed to be. Visas, working permits, um, family reunions, quarantines have been a number of unnecessary obstacles uh, going against the interests of uh, ordinary people, also going against the interests of businesses when you have manpower shortages um, and you're wondering how to get uh, uh, truck drivers uh, and waiters in restaurants. Why don't we go back to this good old pragmatism that we learned from the Brits uh, and try to uh, improve the day-to-day -day situation of ordinary citizens who may have voted uh, for leave or for remain uh, or didn't vote because they were European citizens, but now pay a, a high price for this political decision. Thank you very much indeed. And, and finally, to you, Ambassador. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a good note of the good, good suggestions made. Let, let me be, let me be uh, telegraphic, uh, but substantially. If I, if I, uh, my first point is uh, three words, trust, trust, trust. This is a fundamental commodity in personal relations, but also international relations. And uh, I think we should all focus in raising, uh, uh, elevating, uh, increasing the levels of trust. Uh, across the channel. How do we do that? Uh, I think we do it by showing uh, political will, openness and willingness to find uh, uh, solutions, to implement what we have agreed and to move on. And in that list of priorities, I would put Northern Ireland first uh, as uh, an area in which we definitely need to, to do better and try to uh, to find the common ground that at the same time would create the levels of trust we need the second one climate change we have glasgow in a few weeks uh, uh, we need a, a common front between us and the uk and many others to make uh, glasgow a success thirdly we need to make the tca work and we need to allow the tca to be able to deliver within that as we start all these mechanisms of, of joint uh, uh, work I'm sure we will find problems that we didn't foresee, but we'd also find areas on which maybe we can find uh, solutions uh, that were not for different reasons contemplated in the, in the TCA, but that can be addressed within the limits of the TCA. And my last point, of course, like many others, foreign policy. We were disappointed by uh, the, the lack of willingness on the British side to engage formally with us on this. I think the reality will prove us right in a way that uh, you know, we have so much in common, so much interests, the same values, the same, uh, let's say, constraints in the international scene. This will force us to cooperate. And maybe, you know, instead of building a wall from scratch, we will we'll put building blocks on this wall and sometime we will have a, a nice building in terms of cooperation on foreign policy and security. That's my hope anyway. And again, thank you for uh, the invitation today. Well, can I thank you, uh, Ambassador uh, Almeida? Um, Peter Rickett, Georgina Wright, Natalie Loiseau, and earlier uh, Terry Ranke, all of you for giving up your time for what has been a really interesting and useful session. We are extremely grateful as the UK Trade and Business Commission to all of you for doing so. And our, our work will continue informed by the insights and the expertise that you shared with us today. I almost said order, order, but that concludes uh, today's session. You can log off. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.